well. By the 18th century, I think it was regarded as something uh, exceptional. Uh, except that usually, except for a short period in the aftermath of the Constitution of the 3rd of May, when it does become you know, a, a wonderfully positive example on both sides of the Atlantic uh, and on both sides of the English Channel as well. Uh, apart from that, it's used as a warning. So, for example, in the debates on the drawing up of the American Constitution, there is a, a, a fear uh, that freedom should not degenerate into license or anarchy, and Poland is set up as the, the great warning. Um, so that sense of freedom as being something exceptional is there in the 18th century, but most of the time it is, uh, uh, it is a negative. The great exception being uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau and his considerations on the government of Poland, where he sees that all of the states of Europe rushing to their ruin because they've been corrupted into slavery, but the Poles are still burning with a passion for liberty with uh, all of the fire of their youth. So Rousseau uh, plays a part, uh, which some Subsequently, does play a role in, uh, in some of the thought of the French Revolutionary area uh, in looking to Poland as a sort of a beacon of freedom. Uh, Kościuszko later uh, plays a uh, part uh, in that image of the, of the free Pole uh, you know, burning with passion uh, for freedom. But if we are to go back you know, like two or three hundred years earlier uh, to when the system of the uh, the Kingdom of Poland, later the Commonwealth of Poland and Lithuania is functioning rather well, then it is less exceptional. Certainly at the start of the 16th century, there are many so-called mixed monarchies, estate monarchies, where the monarch is elected, sharing power with the representatives of the nobility, sometimes the clergy, sometimes the towns uh, uh, in parliamentary uh, or estate institutions, uh, that there are many uh, prerogatives uh, guaranteeing personal liberty, property, uh, and other rights uh, in uh, two, two subjects where, that, uh, uh, where the leading inhabitants of the country play a role in the governing of the country. This is not so unusual at all. What happens over the course of the later 16th, 17th, 18th century is that many of these uh, free constitutions are sort of chipped away by monarchs. We never really get to a stage where absolutism becomes a reality in the sense that the monarch has absolute power over everything. But clearly there is a movement where it's much easier for monarchs to destroy their opponents, to levy taxes and make laws without getting the formal consent of their subjects, uh, and to surround themselves with a kind of courtly etiquette uh, which would have uh, made Polish nobles uh, very uncomfortable. Um, the other great exceptions are those of the, uh, the Northwest. We have the United Provinces of the uh, Netherlands. Uh, we have the, the British monarchies. Uh, by the 18th century, we get a sense that there is a mixed constitution uh, in Great Britain, uh, which is capable of securing liberty and property uh, to, uh, to, the, to the country and its uh, inhabitants, uh, but that we have a, another free constitution where it doesn't work so well, namely uh, in Poland, Lithuania which means that some of the uh, reformers of the 18th century, including the uh, Stanisław August's own father, Stanisław Poniatowski, the older, uh, the elder, are looking towards Britain. Okay, we've got a free country here. Why does it work there so much better than it works uh, in Poland, Lithuania? This is precisely the kind of question that I was trying to address uh, in my first book.